Hi, I'm Lynn Cornell, and welcome to Journey Through the Bible Verse by Verse. Grab your Bibles and follow along as we study through each book of the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Keep in mind that I am using the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so if you're reading from a different Bible translation, the read would be different, but the message would be the same. We're going to continue in our study in the fifth chapter of Matthew. I took a little time in these last uh, three videos to really kind of I wanted to kind of kind of lay the foundation here as we move to this chapter, which is uh, commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. And what this Sermon on the Mount is, is remember, it is Jesus instructing those who would be his disciples on what he expects from them, what he expects from us, that he this is his criteria for being his disciples. So, um, verse 25, and he's contrasting, this is what the law says. So he's kind of going back. You've heard that it was said. Well, who was it said by? Well, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the, the, the priests. So he says, you heard that it has been said, and then he contrasts that, where well, here is what the real deal is. This is the spirit of the law. This is what the heart of God. All right, so um, verse 25, he says, Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you are on the way with him. Or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you pay the last penny. Now, um, this is pra some good practical um, <laughs> and, uh wisdom for us to settle something before it reached the court, before it reached a lawsuit. And again, how do you do that? Think about this. One of the bases, remember what Paul wrote in the in, in, in First Corinthians about suing one another. And Paul's basic point was, look at the witness that we're giving. Now there is some benefit, some financial benefit, by the way, that if you could settle something before it goes to court, you, you, you certainly uh, can mi minimize the risk that if the settlement goes against you, make it right. Blessed are the peacemakers, all right? <laughs> uh, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Now, uh, many men are going to shove, uh, shudder at this. And also women, too, by the way, because... Uh, uh, women can be just as lustful as men. But notice what he says here. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. So the physical act of adultery, right? So you may think to yourself, okay, I've never committed adultery. Right? Never, never. Notice what Jesus says in verse 20. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in ad adultery with her in his heart. Oh, yep. <laughs> so if you're lusting after a woman, okay? So notice the contrast. See, the Pharisees would have said, Bob, see, I've never committed adultery. But yet, you're lusting after her. In your mind, you're committing adultery. Now, by the way, let me just say this. If you are, and, and by the way, because when you stand before God, and the Bible tells us that the secrets of man's heart will be revealed. See, oftentimes... From God's perspective, when it's in your heart, you are just as guilty of, of doing it. You may lack situation, circumstances, opportunity. Now, if it's in your heart, if those circumstances or opportunity ever arises, then you will fall. Oftentimes people wonder, how could I have fallen into sin? Well, if it's in your heart, if you've been lusting in your heart. So think about this, man. If you're but why constantly feeding yourself pornography and things like that? It's in your heart. And you may never get the opportunity, right? But if that opportunity does arrive, don't be surprised if you fall into fornication, fall into adultery, fall into these sexual sins. If you've been pumping into your heart. And by the way, I shouldn't just only say um, pornography either, by the way. I shouldn't just say that. 
Look at what, what we have on television. On regular TV, what you can watch. See, we think about XXX pornography, but what about the G-rated stuff that you see on TV? Verse 29, and this kind of solves that. If your right eye called this you to sin, gorge it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than your, than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right eye, right eye causes you to, right hand, I'm sorry, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, obviously this is hyperbole because if this was literally, and I have never seen a person take this literally, that people would <laughs> readily say, oh yeah, hyperbole, because we would all be maimed. We'd be missing eyes, both eyes, right? Both limbs, right? So obviously we, we get what he's saying here, that the source of your sin, the source of what's causing you to sin, separate yourself from that. I don't think that's too hard to understand. Verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, I'm going to save the really good teaching of this when we get to uh, the letters of, of Corinthians. But this is, again, under the law. And under the law, there was a provision. First of all, you go back to Genesis, God made male and female. There was one man, one woman in marriage for life. Sin happened. Later, Jesus is going to address this on another occasion when they will say, well, why did he give us the, the law for uh, divorce? He said, for the hardness of your heart. But here they were divorcing for any reason. And so... Um, the only reason, the only um, clause that the law gave for divorce is for adultery. That was it. Nothing else. And that's pretty really correctly because the, uh, the, the Pharisees had gotten so bad that they were divorcing their wives for any kind of reason. They were permitting divorce for any kind of reason. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said... To our ancestors, you must not break an oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, because it is God's throne, or by the earth, because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it's the city of the king. Neither should you swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. Now, I should stop and say this right here, just to kind of be comical, because a lot of people say, oh, people are coloring their hair. Ah, but not the roots. Okay. All right. Verse 37. But let your word yes be yes and your no, no. Anything more uh, than this is evil or is, is from the evil one. Now, under the law, if you made a vow to God, you had to keep it no matter what. There was an unfortunate story in the book of Judges where a guy vowed and says, God, if you give me this victory, um, the first thing that comes out, I will offer it as a sacrifice. So he went out and um, he won this victory and he came back. His only daughter, whom he loved, came out and he had and he and, and he had to sacrifice her. Now the way he sacrificed her, by the way, he didn't kill her, but she lived a virgin for the rest of her life. So the idea was that don't make a vow. And even in the law, even though the law said, if you're going to make a vow, he says, you got to keep it. So the best thing is don't make a vow. And that's what he's saying. But more than that, by the way, in other words, if he's saying don't swear and don't make oaths. You know, I swear to God that I will pay you back, man. No, I swear to God I didn't do this right now. He says that your character should be so impeccable that your yes is your yes and your no is your no. Plain and simple. Be a person of your word. That's what he's saying. Uh, verse 38. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist the evil door. Now, I'm going to stop because I'm explain what Jesus is quoting. Remember, he's, he's contrasting the law. And under the law, it's said that if you break somebody's tooth, for example, 
or you're working with somebody and you sort of carelessly, you know, damage their eye, you know. That's where this thing is coming from. Under the law, they were to exact, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Okay? Now, so then he comes, so Jesus is saying right here, okay, um, yes, the law said that, but here's what he's going to say. He says, um, and, and by the way, remember, Jesus is speaking this from the standpoint of a person exacting this. Okay, in other words, remember, this is from the, all of the contrasts here are from the, the disciple saying, okay, instead of me um, exacting what I would think is right on my part. So in other words, if someone, if someone damaged my eye, eye for an eye, then I'm going to demand, right, I'm going to demand their eye. So that's what he's referring to right here. It's in my power to get justice. It's in my power to use this to, to, to get revenge. That's what he's talking about here. So verse 39, but I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. Wow. What does he mean by that? On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the white, right cheek, turn the other cheek to him. Now, this has been, another, again, one of the most, again, another misunderstood sort of verse. The, the the, the idea of the slap here is one of an insult slap, not a beating. In other words, somebody starts wailing on it. He's not talking about you sitting there just taking the beating, bam, 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 bam. No. Um, so verse 40, he says, As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him too. Give the, all right, so here's the point. The law says, I didn't have to do that, right? And under the law, if... Um, in fact, we're going to see this where they're going to force a man to help Jesus carry his cross. The idea that if he's saying, if you encounter this, if you um, are in a position, right, somebody slaps you, he says, turn the other cheek. Now, remember, not slapping, an insult slap. Hey, pow! He said, turn the other cheek. If someone sues you for your coat, he says, if someone sues you and takes your shirt away, give them your coat as well. If someone forces you to go a mile, carry go two miles with them. Now, 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 remember, keep in mind, what is the backdrop of all of this? Let your light so shine. Keep that in mind. That's what he's telling his disciples to do. And that is why he's telling his disciples to do, to do that. That is why he's saying to do that. Let your light so shine before men. Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, this is a generic statement and not specifically, because there are some times when you will say no to people who want to borrow. You have heard that it said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, again, notice what he's saying right here. Love your enemies. Pray for those that do you wrong. Why? Because I'm letting my light so shine before men. I'm being that salt. So keep in mind, that's why he's saying that right there. Okay. The one that people think is that, am I to be abused? That's not what he's talking about. But keep in mind that as a disciple, I'm putting myself in the position to my light can shine. See, if somebody slaps me and I turn the other cheek, they're now watching me. If they force, if they sue my, sue me for my shirt and I give them my uh, cloak, they're watching me. If they force me to go one mile and I go two, they're watching me. That is the purpose. Keep that in mind. That is really the only reason why he is saying that. All right, we'll pick up with chapter six next time. 
I'll see you then.